Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Dr. Travis Brown, what is this medical life all about? This is the pursuit of knowledge as we learn about diseases from the ancient times to the present day. These are the stories of medicine. Dr. Travis Brown, in the lead up for this particular episode, do you have any inkling as to why my two daughters, who are 12 and 14, were really gobsmacked and awestruck with the person we're about to have as our guest. No, I didn't. I didn't realise, but that's that's encouraging to hear. Uh, one of those things with a, these episodes is I love to dig into the history of all this. And the amazing thing about our guest coming up is he's lived through it, to be honest. His story is the actual history of us learning about cervical cancer, about HBV, about the importance. Uh, and so... That's one of those things that I can't do it justice. I, I'm sure our, our guest very much will. And I think our guest is ready. Our guest for this episode is Professor Ian Fraser, who was born in Glasgow in Scotland. He studied medicine at Edinburgh University and trained as a renal physician and in clinical immunology. Professor Fraser moved to Australia to continue his training and research at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, which included autoimmune chronic liver disease, viral immunology and the human papillomavirus. After this, he moved to Brisbane with the University of Queensland. Now, in conjunction with Dr. Jan Zhao, Professor Fraser's research led to the development of a vaccine, Gardasil, that prevents HPV infection and the development of cervical cancer. This vaccine has revolutionised cervical cancer worldwide. It's dramatically reduced the incidence and the prevalence of HPV-related disease. Professor Fraser was recognised as Australian of the Year in 2006, awarded the Prime Minister's Prize for Science and the Balzan Prize in 2008, elected Fellow of the Royal Society of London in 2012 and appointed Companion of the Order of Australia on the Queen's Birthday Honours List in 2013. In 2022, it was announced that the Immunology Research Body of the Diamantina Institute will be renamed University Queensland's Fraser Institute. Today, Professor Fraser's our guest on this Medical Life podcast. Welcome to our interview. And thank you for having me, Travis. Can we go right back to the beginning, to the start of your training? Because you studied both renal medicine and clinical immunology. Was this always what you wanted to do? Well, actually, no. <laughs> I went to university to study astrophysics uh, and decided that uh, the career prospects in astrophysics, albeit a very interesting subject, were not all that great. And I took some advice from a number of people and decided that it might be a good idea to study medicine. So then how did you sort of work your way through into renal medicine clinical? What was clinical immunology? What was the thought process behind that? Look, halfway through the training in medicine in Edinburgh at that time, you were expected to do an honours degree in a science subject. And uh, I decided that one of the brighter people that I got the opportunity to meet while I was studying medicine uh, was uh, Dr. John Habershaw. And he was interested in renal medicine and he was interested in immunology. And he took me under his wing for that honours year, but also he introduced me to something called the Metchnikoff Club, which was a club in Edinburgh for people who were interested in the body's defence against infection. And I went along and listened to a lot of their lectures. And that got me really interested in how the immune system fights infection and also raises the question of whether it fights other things as well. So then you moved to Australia to train at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, the WEHI. 
what were you doing there? What was your training like there? Well, I came to Australia because at that time in Scotland, there wasn't really a training program for clinical immunologists. And there, there wasn't a strong feeling that this was a discipline in its own right, whereas the Walter Miser Hall Institute was world recognized as the place that you go to to learn immunology, at least in the 1980s. And I decided that I would go there. And I had already been there as an undergraduate student. Uh, one of the parts, one again of the training requirements for the medical degree was that you did three months elective somewhere. And I decided that since I was interested in immunology, the somewhere would be Melbourne and the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And so I was already known to several of the senior people in the Hall Institute and uh, Ian Mackay, who was the head of the clinical immunology that took me under his wing and offered me a job. He told me I should come back when I was graduated and trained as a doctor. And I kind of forgot about that. But uh, we came back from holiday, I and my wife, some five years after I graduated, and there was a telegram on the doormat. <laughs> Nobody gets telegrams anymore, but in those days she did. And the telegram basically said, where the heck are you? Why aren't you here in Australia? <laughs> so we had to make a decision about that and decided we would head off to Australia and uh, give it a go for a couple of years. And in the process, I would get a qualification as a clinical immunologist. Ian, I have to ask, do you have that telegram framed or kept somewhere? We should have kept it, but no, unfortunately, we didn't. <laughs> so nobody gets telegrams. No, no, no it's, a, it's a new concept. This one, but mm. then when I was reading through uh, some of the stories that were coming through, your interest was actually in autoimmune chronic liver disease to begin with. What took you down that path? Well, that was the flavour of the house, so to speak, in the Walter and Liza Hall Institute. The the lab I was working in was interested in autoimmune liver disease. And uh, that was quite a good place to start because uh, there wasn't, I mean, it was well understood that there was an autoimmune liver disease and that you could treat it by suppressing the immune system. But exactly how the disease came about wasn't really known. And what was being done there at that time was reasonably groundbreaking work where they showed, first of all, that uh, there was an important genetic makeup component to whether you got that disease or not. And then on top of that, we could identify some of the self-antigens that the immune system decided to attack to cause the disease. And uh, so it was all exciting stuff and you know, breaking off in chunks, as they say in those days. So then how do you go from autoimmune chronic liver disease with pretty much viral hepatitis, which I think was hepatitis B at the time, to yeah. through to genital warts uh, HPV research? Yeah, well, the bit that was in the middle that uh, sort of joined the two together was HIV, uh, in that uh, the I one of the things that I did while I was at the Hall Institute at that time was to start up a clinic for people with uh, what was then referred to as gay lymphadenopathy syndrome, which uh, we would now recognise as HIV. Uh, because I was interested in the immune system and its defence against virus infection, of course, that was very important topic in the early 1980s and uh, so I set up that clinic uh, and learned quite a lot about HIV AIDS in the process but one of the things that I realized was that these men who had sex with men had a problem with papillomavirus infection with warts genital warts particularly and uh, worked with a doctor in Melbourne Dr Gabriel Medley who was interested in HPV and cervical disease and we together did a study looking at the cytology and then subsequently the virology of these warts and came to the conclusion that these genital warts were not only genital warts, they were also genital precancers and they were caused by HPV infection in somebody who also had HIV at the time. So the immune system was obviously normally keeping this condition under control, but if you took the immune system away, then the HPV could go on and cause cancer. Ian, just as you mentioned that with the HIV uh, dominance at that particular point in our history, do you ever reflect on, on the happenstance that is part of our medical breakthroughs? Because you were still doing your research, but it was because of the, pro the prevalence of HIV at the time that this middle stepping stone occurred. Yeah, look, you, I think it would be fair to say that... Uh, uh, scientists are always looking for something interesting and new. 
uh, where it's always better to be on the upside of the wave than on the downside of the wave, to use a surfing analogy. <laughs> but I was particularly interested in this concept of a chronic virus infection that caused disease, because to some extent, that was what I thought was going on in the liver disease as well. Mm. And uh, we normally regard infections as something that come and go, at least at that time, that was the common belief. Whereas what we were learning and what we've learned so subsequently in spade is that the of many of the viruses that cause problems in humans, we get them and then they don't go away, but they leave themselves a fingerprint, if you like, in the body's uh, immune system, and they can continue to cause disease over long periods of time, even although we don't see anything very much clinically going on. Mm. So after the, your research with uh, WeHi, you then moved to Brisbane. Did this help with the continuing HPV research? Look, okay, I, when I moved to Brisbane, I it was partly because I on my time at the Hall Institute, uh, Gus Nuttall was the then director, and he uh, he was very clear that uh, we were there for a period of time, and then it was our job to move on and disseminate the word elsewhere. Uh, and uh, so I looked at jobs in Perth and uh, in Brisbane and also in the United States and decided that Brisbane made me the best offer. And I took with me the things that I thought would be useful in terms of helping my research. So I took my interest with papillomavirus and also with HIV and looked after the patients in Brisbane with HIV AIDS at the start of my time there. That was before there were drugs available and there wasn't really very much you could do for the patients other than try and plot their uh, progress. But I, I got a clinic going there and then when the drugs came along, I handed the HIV interest on to the infectious diseases people because they were more interested in the drugs and getting the disease under control. And I just stuck with my interest in papillomavirus and genital warts and cervical cancer. So just the linkage between HPV in, in men and women with pretty much cervical carcinogenesis, when was that link established? Was this around this time, before this time, or after this time? Well, I think I probably put it on the map as far as the men were concerned. I mean, the paper that we published in the, I can't remember, I think it was the Lancet, uh, describing this association of immunosuppression with persisting HPV infection and genital cancer, it matched up to the work that uh, Harold Zerhausen had been doing in Germany. I met, I met Harold uh, in Germany when I went across to find out more about liver disease in his institute. But he told me all about HPV and cervical cancer. And I took that model back to Brisbane and came to the conclusion that it was also true for anal cancer as well. And this was another cancer that was caused by these viruses. So that the, at that time, there was a se beginning to be a serious interest in HPV and cervical cancer. It wasn't by any means certain that the virus was responsible. The tools that we had available at that time were not as good as the tools that we have now. Well, that was a hearty entree for our conversation today. We're gonna to pause, take a quick breath and come back and look more closely at HPV and the vaccine. Returning now with Professor Ian Fraser, we're looking in this particular part of the episode at HPV and the vaccine. Um, when you began studying HPV, how many types were actually known at the time? Well, if you start that when I first met Harold Sirhausen, the answer was probably about four or five, right. most of which caused warts. And then there was his belief that there was one particular virus that was responsible for cervical cancer. The one he was working on turned out to be what we now call HPV-16. Uh, and uh, you can ask what was ha what happened to it, and all the ones between HPV-5 and HPV-16, and the answer was there wasn't very much. But of course, we now know that there are very many papillomavirus types, and people estimated over 400 different human papillomaviruses. But there really were only a very small group that caused or, or ordinary ones, and then a, a slightly larger group that could cause or initiate cancer. So you had a colleague that you worked with, uh, Dr. Jian Xiao, and you decided to make a vaccine. How did that come about? 
Well, we didn't decide to make a vaccine. We decided that we wanted to study the virus. I mean, I was interested in the immunology of the virus and Jan was interested in how the virus caused cancer. And the problem was that unlike 99.9% of viruses, you can't grow papillomavirus in the lab. It just refuses to grow. Uh, most viruses, you put them in with the right cell type and one virus goes in and a million come out. Uh, the cell dies in the process and you get the vast spread of the virus into the cells that you're infecting. Papillomavirus doesn't do that. And it doesn't do it for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because it's very fussy about which sorts of cells it's prepared to infect. It will only infect epithelial cells while they're dividing. And uh, that means basically the basal layers of skin. Uh, and the second thing is that it doesn't really mature as a virus unless the basal cells also mature along with it, so that the cells have to become more skin-like in order to allow the virus to assemble and come out of the cell. And then the third problem is it doesn't kill the cell. It has to wait until the cells fall off before it can pass on to somebody else. So for all of these reasons, we wanted to try and imitate virus in the lab in other words make enough of it we could understand it and that's where jam came in because he was particularly interested in using the then new ex eukaryotic expression system so uh, genetic engineering that could be done in mammalian cells and he uh engineered to make different bits of the viral genome in the laboratory and put them into vectors which could be able to work in eukaryotic cells and, uh, if you like, in human cells. And uh, he managed to make these two proteins, which we now recognize as being the coat of the virus. Uh, that of itself didn't make a vaccine, and it didn't even really particularly get us thinking about vaccines. I was still interested in uh, how the body saw the virus and whether the immune system could actually recognize there was a virus there. And Jan was interested still in how the virus caused cancer. But we did want to try and see if we could assemble the virus in the lab. So we basically, if you like, took the genetic information of the virus, put it into epithelial cells, and looked to see if we could get virus coming out. And we tried that in Cambridge, where I was on sabbatical with Jan at that time, and then back in Brisbane when Jan came back to work in Brisbane with me. And the first nine months of trying that, we basically saw nothing happening. Uh, but we learned a few things along the way about what might be important, and then eventually came up with a very important observation that the capsid protein of the virus didn't behave itself the way that most viral genes do. It didn't start at the beginning and go all the way through to the end. Uh, we now recognize that's very common for virus, for, for virus and other genes, but at that time, that was quite a novel idea. And so we tried starting the expression of the viral coat in different places. And when we did that with both bits of the viral coat in the same cell and starting at what we thought were the correct starting places rather than the ones which were obvious, we got these things called virus-like particles. And the important part of that was that we didn't actually have to do anything very much to make the proteins assemble into virus-like particles. They did it for themselves if we got the recipe right. When we saw that we were getting virus-like particles without us having to do much in the way of spe spe specific manipulation in the lab, we realized that there was the potential for getting a vaccine against HPV because these virus-like particles would look to the body's immune system just the same as the virus would. And that turned out as it happened to be true. I mean, we didn't know that it was going to until we did it, and we didn't really expect it would work, but it actually did. And we ended up with these virus-like particles, which we then went on to show could induce an immune response, which would bind to the virus. I know Dr. Travis Brown is aching to continue this narrative, but I have to ask, how many people on sabbatical undertake this sort of research, which ends up being world-changing? Well, I don't know the answer to that. Some people go on sabbatical for holidays, others because they want to learn something. But I went to Cambridge to learn, right. and I was fortunate to meet Chan Tzu there. Uh, and we bounced off each other well because we were both, we were the people who were in the lab at night and at weekends. And <laughs> my my wife and family were with my mother 
who was in Scotland and I was in Cambridge, so I was better employed doing something in the lab than going to the pub. <laughs> and uh, Jan was of a similar mind, and he had his wife with him, who was very attentive to making sure all his technical details of his experiments were right. So we had a good team, yeah. and the three of us managed to make it work. Now, looking back at the virus, you actually started with HPV-16, as you mentioned, one of the high risk, the other one being 18. But can you tell us there was a few challenges with this specific virus and, and trying to actually do what you were doing with it at the time? Well, yes, we really worked with HPV-16 because that was the one which at that time was accepted as being the one that caused cancer. What we and others didn't know was that the genetic information of that virus that was in common circulation at that time, you know, passed from lab to lab, was incorrect. It had a mistake in it. Uh -huh. And that mistake was there because they had cloned the viral genome out of a cancer. So that the, in, in the cancer, the viral genome wasn't working as a viral genome properly, and it couldn't make the capsid proteins correctly. So we did a little bit of homework on that and went and looked at, did some sequencing and uh, looked at other papillomaviruses and what the sequence looked like there and came to two conclusions. One was that there was a definite mistake in the then so-called Gisman strain that was circulating at the time, which we had to correct, which we did. And then more importantly, it looked very much to us like the translation of the genetic information shouldn't start at the beginning of the virus. It should start somewhere downstream in the virus where there was more likely to get a string of amino acids which would assemble the right shape. And that turned out also to be true, fortunately. And uh, we, But the readout was pretty primitive because all we could really do at that time was look to see if we could see virus-like particles down the electron microscope. And Deborah Stenzel, who was the microscopist, uh, got kind of fed up with us keeping sending samples and there'd be nothing in them, another one, and there'd be nothing in it. And then eventually, about nine months into that exercise, we hit the right mixture and ended up with these things that looked like, looked like the virus. I mean, they, they, they self-assembled. And that was the critical bit. The, the protein itself turned out not to be a good vaccine. It didn't protect. But if it's self-assembled into virus-like particles, it's induced the right sort of antibody to neutralize the virus. As it turned out, that then became the vaccine. So then looking, I think you've given us a good description of how the vaccine works. So is this something you've uh, pretty much assembled uh, and then you get an immune response from it and that protects them. I mean, how how is, is this sort of working to protect the, the patient? Yeah, the, the virus-like particles are not infectious. They're not the virus. They're just the skin of the virus. And they are seen by the body's immune system as being the virus. In other words, the immune system recognizes the outside of this in the same way as it would recognize the virus. So giving these virus-like particles induces antibody, very conventional vaccine, and the antibody can bind onto the real virus. So that uh, that basically is how the vaccine works. I mean, it was a technically difficult exercise to make the virus-like virus -like particles, but once you got there, the immunology was very simple. You use the virus-like particles with an adjuvant and you got an immune response which bound to the virus and neutralized it. And looking at the clinical impact, so the research of once you started vaccinating people, what was the impact on HPV infections and cervical cancer? Well, of course, there was a big gap between what we did and the vaccine becoming available as a commercial product. Uh, we, we did the work back in 1991 and told the world about it then after having filed a patent, I must point out. <laughs> but that then got the interest of several vaccine manufacturing companies and we worked with two of them specifically, uh, eventually the settling on Merck as our, as our preferred one, um, GSK being the other one. And they had to scale up what we were doing from teaspoons full to vats full in order, of course, to make a vaccine. That was very hard too. It wasn't trivial. So it took some time to do that. And then having done it, it, of course, takes a long time to show that the vaccine actually is safe first of all in animals, then in humans, and then to design and do the studies necessary to prove that you could use that vaccine to prevent HPV infection and disease associated with HPV in humans. 
So there was about a 15-year period between the time that we did our bit of the process and the vaccine first becoming available for use for protecting women against HPV infection and, of course, now men as well. So when it all came through, were you expecting the benefits to come through the the reduction in incidence? Yes, well, obviously that was the aim of the exercise and the clinical trials that were done showed very clearly that the uh, vaccine was able to reduce the incidence of cervical precancer, so CIN23. These these studies involved tens of thousands of women because only one in a hundred women who get exposed to the virus will get a chronic infection with the virus and only chronic infections can go on to cause cancer. So that uh, the to do a study to show that you're protecting 100 women, you have to put out, you have to put 10,000 women into the study. Mm-hmm. And they all got vaccinated and they all made an immune response. And if they had had the placebo, then they got vaccinated and they didn't have an immune response. And the ones that were placebo recipients got cervical precancer with the expected frequency and the ones who got the real vaccine got no cervical precancer. Mm. And just finally, this area, when you're doing all this, because I remember when it came out about a discussion almost in the political realm of to give it to kids, to give it to children, uh, what age, and that became a real... Were you aware of the political nature you were going into when you were developing this, the, the theory and the vaccine? Well, there was a little bit of a hint of that prior to the vaccine being available, but it really only became obvious that this was going to be a controversial issue when the vaccine was demonstrated effective. I mean, people found it hard to accept the concept of a vaccine to protect against a sexually transmitted infection that had to be given to young women at the age of 12 to 14 because they had to then also accept that their young women were becoming sexually active at the age of 12 to 14. Therefore, you had to get the vaccine in before they became sexually active. We now recognise that that's pretty straightforward, but uh, in those days that was quite controversial. And certainly the Howard government in Australia had Tony Abbott getting up and saying, well, we don't really think it's a good idea to vaccinate against sexually transmitted infections. Philosophically, if we had had the opportunity, we would have done it a different way and said, look, this is a vaccine to prevent cervical cancer and never mentioned the word papillomavirus at all, because that would have been a much easier story to sell. And indeed, now when you're introducing it to new countries, it is introduced as a vaccine to prevent cervical cancer, and papillomavirus simply doesn't get mentioned. Wow. Uh, Plenty of food for thought there, but that covers the history to this point. We'd like to look into the future in just a moment, back on This Medical Life. Professor Ian Fraser, just in our last segment, you were talking about the political discourse about how old people should be when they are allowed to have this uh, vaccine, etc. Let's perhaps pick up from there. What are the current recommendations for when to vaccinate both boys and girls? Oh, well, in Australia and globally, it's a vaccine that's given routinely to 12 to 14 year olds. In some countries, eight to 10 year olds. We we did in Vanuatu showed it was a good idea to go a bit earlier for some countries. And uh, the the optimal way to do it is just to give it to everybody at that age. School-based programs are effective and most countries have opted to use a school-based program to deliver the vaccine. So I wanted to ask though, we, we understand the recommendations for children and you want to get it uh, before they're sexually active. Is there any benefit in vaccinating someone who has already been sexually active, maybe in their 20s or 30s, who hasn't received the vaccine? Well, the short answer is yes, but we don't know how much benefit there is. I mean, the, the, if they've already got the infection, we, it won't, the vaccine won't do anything. It doesn't cure an existing infection. So you have to get it before you get exposed to that particular type or those particular types of HPV. There are five different HPV types in the current widely used vaccine. And uh, you might have had 
one or two of those types, you might not have had the other three, so there's still potential benefit from being vaccinated. And that's true at, an, at almost any age if you get down to the nitty gritty. But the best benefit, obviously, the most cost effective way of protecting against cervical cancer is to get it before and you get any of the viruses, and therefore ideally before the age of about 10 to 12. Mm. So you just mentioned there was there's five types in the current uh, HPV vaccine. Is that yeah. number going to increase or will it change at all? Look, we probably don't need to change it. We vaccinate against the two types of papillomavirus, which most commonly cause genital warts in the same vaccine. So we're protecting against the five types that most commonly cause cervical cancer and the two types that most commonly cause genital warts. These viruses are genetically very stable. There's no evidence that they've changed over tens of thousands of years. And there's no evidence that they are going to change under selection pressure with the vaccine. So being double-stranded DNA viruses, they are genetically very stable, and I really don't think we'll see change. I think we'll just eventually eliminate these viruses through widespread immunization. So then looking to the future, where do you think the research for this is going, or is this area pretty solidly, solidly covered? We can still do work, you know. The, the, for the, the prophylactic vaccines, the challenge is to get them into the developing world effectively. Schools-based programs seem to be best, but do we need one shot, two shots, three shots? Traditionally, now we give two. We started with three. There's a lot of talk about just giving a single shot, which makes it much, much easier to deliver a program because you don't have to keep any records. You just immunize everybody you see, basically, and uh, that seems to work pretty effectively. The other consideration for the future, of course, is that there are quite a lot of women who are of an age that they probably have had HPV infection, and we really want to think about whether we can use the knowledge of the virus to provide an immunotherapy to get rid of an existing HPV infection. At the moment, we just do destructive surgery. That's all we have at our disposal if somebody's already got the virus. And if they've got precancer, we destroy the tissue that the virus is in. But it might be possible to make use of the immune system to fight the virus infection that's already there. We have no direct evidence at the moment that we can achieve that, but we've got plenty of indirect evidence to say that the body's immune system fights the virus off quite effectively in a lot of people. So if the body's immune system can do it, we can teach the immune system to do it. And then as we're looking uh, your time in research, uh, and clearly uh, you've had lots of uh, PhD students, so I think you believe you've had 42 students, 20 postdocs, and this is sort of the legacy you're wanting to leave. Can you tell us a little bit about that time? Look, I've been a researcher most of my career, and the bit that gives me the most satisfaction is teaching other people who want to be researchers how to do it themselves. You know, the research is best done well, it's done in groups, but you really are the individuals or the people that come up with the bright ideas. And therefore, what you need to do is put them in an environment where they can take the bright ideas and follow them up. And uh, I was very fortunate the whole institute provided that environment for me when I was there. And when I came to Brisbane, it was a little tougher because I had to set up a laboratory there. There wasn't anything going, but at least I had the financial support of the institute that I was working for. And that gave me the opportunity to employ people to work with me. I, I think that uh, we need to encourage young scientists to give full thought to the things that they think are most important because they will pick things that are going to make a difference. You know, programmed research is not so easy. Research where people just have good, bright ideas and see things and then make decisions about what they're going to study, that's the best way to make use of researchers. Now, you announced your retirement for uh, last year, and I just wanted to ask, is there any lessons that you have learned that you wish you knew earlier in your career? Oh, yes. Yeah, so well, that's always the question, isn't it? I mean, look, I think I probably could have done less time in the lab and got just as far as I got. I would have had more time with my kids when they were growing up, and that's always an important part of things. I do encourage my students to think about that and make sure that they have a life outside of science because science can become very engrossing and you can spend a lot of time pursuing your interest in science, but you've also got to have a life outside of science as well. The other thing I think I would probably pick up as a lesson is that you've got to learn to sell your science. 
the audience is not receptive by and large, especially when you come and ask for money. So that what you have to do is to make a good case for why what you're doing at the moment is the most important thing you can be doing and hopefully the most important thing that will come out of wherever you're working. And it doesn't always work out that way, but you've got to start with the assumption that people wish to be persuaded that you're doing something really good. So learning how to go out there and talk to the media, talk to the donors, talk to other scientists, sell it to your family too, of course, because they've got to be part of the act. That's all really important. And young scientists should automatically get media training. They should be encouraged to go out there and talk to as many non-scientists as they can. We teach them how to talk to scientists, go off and give this nice PowerPoint presentation to a group of people who already know what you've been doing and probably don't really need to hear it from you again. But going out and talking to the general public about why what you're doing right now is really important and will make a significant difference in the future. You know, we're, the work that we're now doing in the lab is very much focused on immunotherapy for cancer. And we are trying quite a, quite unexpected routes to try and cure, can, particularly skin cancer, using the bacteria that grow on your skin. So you've got to be able to go out there and excite people about this and say, hey, look, we're getting a treatment for skin cancer, which might stop you having all the problems you're going to have when you're older, simply by getting rid of the pre-cancer lesions right now using bacteria. That's such an important point. I'm a big watcher of a program called Media Watch on ABC TV, and they often point the finger when universities go a bit too hard on selling the science, and then shows like A Current Affair pick up the tabloid edge. Is it worth it, though? Because even if they go a little bit askew, at least it's peaking interest in bodies that might fund this research and, and carry it further. What's, what's your reading on the current state of play? Well, the first one, sell it on its on curiosity value and don't promise what you can't deliver. You know, if, if you say this will be in the clinic in five to seven years, you've got to have some justification for that statement. And most things that you work on think 15 to 20 years, not five to seven. Mm. If it's five to seven years out, that means you're already doing a clinical trial. And you're getting, gathering evidence that what you have already shown in some laboratory model works. And you're now testing it out in humans to see if it's safe. Three years out, you're testing to see if it really works in the people that you'd like to target. So, you know, you, you've got to keep those numbers right. Otherwise, people get expectations which you can't deliver on. But having said that, you don't sell it on the fact that we're there in five years. You sell it on the fact that this is a novel way of dealing with this particular problem that a lot of people have got. And we're learning about how it works and how best to deal with it. But if you start looking at, you know, this standard statement that you see almost at every television channel news program now, that they, this is really exciting and then we expect to see it in the clinic in five to seven years' time, you know it's wrong. <laughs> but in the process, they're learning something about how this disease works and maybe, maybe they'll have something which will make a big difference for the disease. And it might even be in five to seven years' time. But if you promise five to seven years, people will come back and ask you why it hasn't happened. Yes, there's a very popular science podcast called The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, and they have a drinking game with every time there's a press release that says five to seven years out uh, in our field. But just finally, Ian, look, a number of our audience are general practitioners, they're medical students or, or scientists. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to leave with them on, on this topic? Look, I think the most important thing anybody who's involved with health and medical research is to understand that it is very important to take part in research. It doesn't matter whether you're working in general practice, whether you're working as a medical student, where you're working as a scientist, you should be thinking about what questions do we need to answer and how do we go about doing it? I mean, general practice otherwise is quite formulaic person comes in with a problem, give them a script and send them on their way. If you then turn that into a research program, you maybe find out whether you're doing the right thing or not, and or you'll help others find out. But you'll also be more interested in what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I think this, in general practice, as in almost every aspect of medicine, there's plenty of opportunity to go out there and learn something and help others do better. And that's I like enjoy doing too, just encouraging people to go out and ask the right questions. 
I think that explains why a former guest of our program, Professor Simon Dimmitt, said he thinks of you as a national treasure, Ian. Because yes, well, yes, it's better to be a living treasure than a dead one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Ian Fraser, thank you so much for being on This Medical Life. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Douglas, for having me. This Medical Life is recorded in the Talked About Marketing Studios in Adelaide. For show notes and more information about the podcast, visit thismedicallife.com.au. You can contact the hosts via Twitter. Dr. Travis Brown is at Dr. Travis Brown. That's DR for doctor. And Steve Davis is at Steve Davis. Editing and production is by Tim Whiffen. Design is by Tom Buzzenjutt. This has been a Pathnotes Proprietary Limited production. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.